everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unsubscribe, the Demand Drive podcast. I am your host, AJ Alonzo. I've got my co-host with me today, Alex Ellison, wearing a pretty nice purple shirt. Actually, is that a periwinkle? I really Thank like you. Yeah, color. maybe lavender. It's a good color. I like the shirt a lot. Yeah. Is it soft? It looks soft, too. It's soft. Yeah. If you want to, since I'm in Boston this week, we're actually in the same office. If you want to come feel my shirt, AJ, you, you can't. I'll let you. We'll see. We'll see. It, this is tough for the audio only listeners of this episode. We're like, <laughs> what is that shirt going to look like? Um, Alex is with me as always, and we've got Taylor Del Duduce. He's the uh, founding SDR at Certain and co founder at Quack. We're going to be talking with him uh, about cold calling, orchestrating the perfect cold call, as he as he has described it to us in our pre show. So, Taylor, give a quick introduction to yourself, um, people who don't know who you are. What is Certain all about? What is Quack all about? And what are you all about? The old Taylor 101. Yeah, no, appreciate this, AJ um, and Alex. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, yeah, a little bit of myself. So I've been an SDR or an SDR world uh, for over almost two years now, um, coming up on that, um, where I've been an SDR at Clue and then now at Certain, where I'm the founding SDR. Um, obviously, Certain's a bit more larger of a company than like a 20 person company that usually has the SDR team being built out. Um, so came on as they decided to bring it in-house um, instead of outsourcing the SDR role. So um, came on as one of the first in-house SDRs um, to really build out the program. And um, as they've never done that before um, at certain. And so came in, did that um, and was a SDR or came into my first SDR gig at Clue, which was before where I spent a year and a half. Um, where I moved up from being uh, just an account specialist, which is their SDR title then a lead account specialist where I was helping coach. Um, and all throughout that, I was on the enterprise side of things. Um, and then just recently, um, so launch, starting to launch a company called Quack, um, which is basically a cold calling platform to make cold calling easier um, for SDRs. Um, basically, it's a power and parallel dialer, which allows uh, SDRs to, instead of calling one by one in outreach or sales loft, which we all know is very time consuming and uh, you listen to a dial tone all day. Uh, we wanted to make a much more accessible dialer um, or SDRs um, with the SFD market to you know, have the ability to call and automate um, a lot of their calling, like, whether that's calling one person at a time with their power dialer or upwards of six people with our parallel dialer um, to listen to a dial tone once and have more conversations prospect. So, yeah. Nice. Man, you talk about making it easy. I started as an SDR like 10 years ago, and I picked up a Polycom phone, like a physical Polycom and had to yeah. punch numbers in all day long. So yeah. talk yeah. about trying to make like 80 dials a day with a power dialer. That's like absolutely a nothing breeze. compared to the, the amount of calories that I burned picking the phone up. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. Uh, well, I don't, I don't want to bury the lead here um, on this episode, because when we were talking pre-show, you said that you've developed this over over your time as an SDR, uh, this orchestration of like a perfect cold call. And when we talked, you said that a hefty majority, I think it was like upwards of 80 plus percent of all of the meetings that you book come via cold call rather than channels like email or social or, or others. Um, so, so talk me through that. How do you, A, like view cold calling as an SDR, as someone who does it day in and day out, building a tool to make it easier? Um, and then how do you kind of perfect that art to orchestrate a cold call where, um, you know, majority of the time you're able to connect with someone, relay a, a, a valuable pitch, and then actually get them to book a meeting with you? Yeah, so... It definitely is above 80%. I've um, we chat about that where a lot of my meetings come from cold call mainly because I'm not a huge emailer. If anyone looks at my LinkedIn posts, I kind of doubt emailing a little bit here and there. Um, obviously, obviously, having being omni-channel or being able to reach out in other channels still makes a lot of sense. I'm not saying don't do emailing or LinkedIn um, sales now or whatever other channels you use. You do gifting or anything like that. But when it comes to cold calling, um, where that's a lot of that has come from is because when I first started in S the SDR world, I wanted to get on the phones. I wanted to start pitching more. I wanted to you know, really start converting quicker than what I thought email could do for me. And so every morning from eight o'clock till nine o'clock, I would do something that I call, well, not I call, but um, it's a, a concept called eat the frog, which is just doing the thing you hate most in the morning. 
Um, and at that point it was cold calling. I didn't, I wasn't as comfortable on the phones and pitching, um, my company services at that point, And I wanted to get better at it. So I would make 25 dials every morning from eight to nine, which really helped me build a better way of doing cold calling and allowed me to, you know, a lot of those mornings, eight to nine, I would book meetings and then I would set myself up. So I didn't even have to end up doing emails later on because I would already book my meetings in the morning. Um, so that's probably a case as to why I've never spent a lot of time doing emails, but, um, yeah, so I would do that. And that's really what laid the foundation for me to really spend a lot more time in cold calling and focus on that channel. When it comes to the perfect cold call, in my opinion, and a lot of that is learned from, um, those and, uh, those times is this idea that there's obviously your opener when you're just saying, Hey, John, how's your day going? Whatever the normal opener, when someone picks up the phone, there's nothing like special in there. I don't believe that you need any, some crazy opening to a, to a cold call. It's really about once you get past that point, which is, you know, Hey, John, how's it going? They say, great. You said, I usually go with the talk track, you know, in, in certain cases, I'll be like, Hey, I'm calling from certain. I'm curious if you've ever heard of us before or, and why I say, or there is because I want to give them some sort of ability to say no or feel like they're in control of the call just because you're calling them totally out of the blue. So at least gives them that sense at the beginning. And then from there, they'll usually say no because we're a startup. And at the end of the day, no one really knows about startups. It's like you're like an 80,000 person company. Um, so they usually typically say no. And I say, great, well, I'm actually catching you totally out of the blue. Do you mind if I take a second to explain why I'm calling for? And I say it again, because I still want to give them that ability to just be like, no. Typically, these people stay on the phone with me. I'll I'll start going through my pitch. I don't have a lot of people hang up just because I give them that power, um, which is somewhat counterintuitive, but um, it's made a lot of sense for me and worked a lot. And then from there, this is where like the real, like what I believe is like a great cold call and what a great situation would be for a cold call is, is you never want to pitch your, what you're doing until you get a pain from them. There's absolutely no point. If you find that you're pitching before you have a pain, then you can probably 90% of that of the time that you're doing that, that cold call isn't going to convert into a meeting um, just because you're pitching nothing to them. They, you have no idea why you're pitching them something. Mm -hmm. So typically my route then goes from after uh, asking them if I can take a second to explain what I'm calling and they say yes, you have that permission. You know, I usually go into just asking them or you explain a little bit more about what certain does. So they have a little bit of context, you know, we're a background check company. I, I'll tell them that just to give them a little bit of context. And then from there, I immediately ask them some sort of question that allows me to understand if they have a pain or not. Um, and that really depends on what your company does. Um, I'm sure everyone knows what a question would do, would be to open up that pain. So you ask that question. And then if you get a pain, then you pitch after. And so at that point, now you've set yourself up that you have something that you help with to a degree. Um, and then that's great. And that's the first section. Then you want to repeat that again. And this is a perfect situation. So you get that pain, you pitch, you immediately ask a question before you give them that much time to then go off and wonderland in your cold call. And then they take it over. So you, you pitch and then you ask another question and then you get another pain from them or something that is degree, maybe a continuation on from that past pain that you heard. And then you pitch again. And then from there, you book the meeting. So after that, you, you pitch, you get their slight answer, uh, whether that's, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, we don't have something like that. And then you pitch the meeting. And that's what I've seen as the best situation for cold calls and what I believe is like a perfect cold call at the end of the day, because one, you didn't pitch until you got a pain, which is sets you up for a lot more success. And you ask opening questions that allow you to open them up to giving you a pain, which then even if it goes awry, you can go back to, oh, well, you said this on the call. Mm. And then you can go back to that and then use that to then book a meeting. Even if they say no because of time or something, you could go with, oh, well, I know this is a problem. Curious if you're open to me just showing you what we're doing. So you can get a sense of that. And then you at least get something on that cold call. So um, that's what I fully believe is like the perfect cold call um, to an end degree. Um, maybe not everyone agrees with that, but that's uh, that's what I believe uh, would end up being a perfect cold call and a perfect situation to walk away from. Yeah, uh, it's, it's very cool. It, it's cool because I feel like cold calls can go sort of any which way and you sort of figure it out 
what the best way is for you. Obviously, I'm sure they got off the rails, but um, the the piece that I really like there is you start by giving them control of the conversation, but then you point out later on, like you need to take that back from them. You can't let them take it over. And I think too many conversations around cold calling and around being an SDR is about like, I need to control the conversation because I'm the SDR. I'm trying to get this out of them. And the worst thing to do is give them power in this conversation. When in reality, you really pointed to it like it should be a back and forth. If they're telling you about their pains, you don't want to stop them, right? If they're going to keep going. But at the same time, you need to know when you should stop them or when you should pivot the conversation with the next question and things like that. So uh, I just really wanted to, to emphasize that. Um, in terms of the unpredictability that I mentioned, what happens when things aren't going wrong? Do you have similar steps for like, say they throw an objection at you or a pain at you that, that, that you can't handle or like that your your product can't do? Do you have different directions you can go when some of those roadblocks are thrown at you mid-conversation? Yeah, if there's an objection that you get where you can't actually like handle it in the way that your product actually helps with what they're looking for, at the end of the day, that might be just a dead conversation and not the greatest prospect to speak to. If they're looking for something that isn't something that you help with, and um, that just may not make sense. Um, but you could figure out maybe where that root cause is. Maybe that root cause is coming from something that you actually do help with, and it just is something that you haven't heard before, or um, it, it isn't exactly what they're saying uh, it seems to be, because you can figure that out. So really from there, you want to ask a probing question to understand why that's an issue. And then you kind of get back to, okay, understand why it's an issue. If they give you that a pain that you solve for, then it goes back and you come, you, you find yourself back in there. Now you pitch and what you do. So there are some things where you have to divert, just understand why, but it's still finding that way back and asking questions to then find that pain to then pitch. So it's always working its way backwards. So, um, yeah, I think as long as it's something that you can solve for, it's worth continuing the conversation. But as soon as you get to something where you can't solve for it and your pro you know that your product doesn't solve for it, it's just not worth it. They're not the best prospect. They're not someone that's going to come in for a meeting anyways. Obviously, maybe continue asking just for market research if you're at a startup and you need some more information as an SDR that could help you um, show you're doing a lot more than just prospecting, booking meetings. You're helping out the company as a whole. Um, but yeah, that that's might be the case. Yeah. Uh, there's this like rhetoric that um, buyers don't want to be sold to anymore. Like we, you see numbers that like Gartner and Forrester are putting out that like, you know, X, I think it's like 44% of buyers reported that they'd prefer some type of like seller less experience and that they're doing a ton of research beforehand and only really talking to somebody when they feel like they want to make a decision. They're kind of past that like awareness stage in the buyer's journey. And I think this shift coincides with a lot of sellers, SDRs acting as more of a guide rather than someone trying to like mm -hmm. sell something. And, and and the way that you frame and orchestrate your cold call really speaks to that in that like, I think I can help you. I'm asking you questions to figure out if that's the case. Like you just said to Alex, it, if that's not the case, great. Like I figured out that you're not a good prospect for me and I'm not going to try and push you into a meeting that you don't want to take and that doesn't do anything for the business overall. But if I do think so, I'm going to strongly suggest that like I'm guiding you to the right decision. It's it's our product. We can help you solve the thing that you just talked about. And I think mm -hmm. that that speaks volumes to how perfect is kind of an absolute definition of what we're talking about here. But like a cold call that somebody would actually want to receive versus the, mm -hmm. the dreaded cold call that we kind of look at when um, you envision tech sales, right? an SDR pitching you something that you might need, but probably don't and kind of strong arming you into taking a meeting so that the SDR gets calmed. And then the buyer ends up spending 30 yeah. minutes in the demo that they don't care about. And I think that's like the, the typical look at like what cold calling is, uh, but you're describing a way where, you know, you aren't taking that mentality. You're acting as more of a guide and it's more of like a mutual benefit, which I think is the big kind of unlock here for a lot of people listening is that, cold calling shouldn't be one-sided right like it shouldn't be just me benefiting because i got you to take a meeting you should benefit too i'm finding a way for for us to help you solve a challenge and um, talk to me a little bit about like that i guess the mentality that people have towards cold calling as like a buyer getting a cold call right it's something that most people yeah. dread breaking that um sort of uh i guess vision of like the crappy cold call and the crappy sdr um 
what have you seen online? Like, what are you trying to do to kind of like rectify that? Or like, have you seen other people kind of taking the same path that you have and acting as more of like a guide versus the the strong armed SDR? Yeah, I think there's a few things. So um, when you were talking, I was just thinking about when I first started my first SDR in the SDR world, like they, that company went much more on the route of we take a consultative approach. We don't try and sell people. I think that really lived with me a lot, whether that's true or not in any company, because companies can say that and that's not really the case. But at the end of the day, if you're always taking a consultative approach, I, I believe that really comes to that you're that the best salesmen don't sell. They just help you understand what is the best situation for you. Um, and that comes with making sure that you're understanding their pains and solving their pains instead of just throwing random stuff at them and saying this makes sense or telling them something that you know when i think it's uh it's so annoying when you listen to a conversation and you know that the answer should be you know xyz but some, you the salesperson says something different because it works out better for them if it's that that um is the answer instead and that's just not a consultative approach whether you make money or not you know that's why people who strong arm a prospect into a meeting that's because you want to get comp like you said it's not because that makes sense for the person on the other side of the call. It's because you want to be calm. So is that a consultative approach? No, because now you're strong arming them. So they're even less likely to convert later on. You know, if you're trying to get them to buy a $50,000 piece of software, that's probably not the best situation to do in the best, yeah. the, the best uh, initial approach. Um, so that's one of the thoughts that I th had. And then the other thing is, I think that comes into play when it comes to SDRs that um, maybe strong i end up having the strong on prospects or don't take a much more simple approach of just consultative and asking a pain and then pitching is this idea of getting commission breath on a cold call mm -hmm. and that's when you need to hit quota and so you need anything to convert and you need this call to convert because like you know why we're creating quack is because you don't not a lot of prospects pick up the phone anyways i think industry average is almost like every hundred dials you should book one meeting now, that's a lot of dials to then book one meeting and so, you know, when you get that person that calls us could convert, obviously, you know, if you have quota in two days that you need to get to because you've missed quota, you know, three months of the past six and you really want to get there, you're not going to be thinking, oh, I should be taking a consultative approach and I should let this prospect, you know, tell me, you know, what the best situation is. So, and um, I think that's one thing that SDR is when, when you get rid of that commission, commission breath and that can be because you fully believe that you're still going to hit quota or that, you know, quota is not the end result of you strong arming a prospect. It's because you're taking the consultative approach over time and you build up that snowball effect where you can then hit, you know, I believe fully that you should be working from the 15th to the 15th of a month, not from the 30th to the 30th. So if you build that up and you snowball that, you end up hitting quota halfway through the month. And then that way you don't have commission breath. That's one way of getting rid of it. And then um, obviously in general, though, not having commission breath is a great thing that'll help. So um, those are two things that come to mind when it, when it comes to the SDR world and what I've heard some people say, I don't believe people talk about it a lot. There's a lot of the you know, SDR influencers or sales influencers on LinkedIn that talk about it to a degree. Um, but I think the most real ones that are actually speaking how you should be doing sales are speaking on it. And there definitely are um, a few out there. So yeah, yeah. I, I like I like the 15th to the 15th idea. And I think like coupled with a, like a framework, like you kind of laid out at the beginning of this episode where like, I know that I have something to root my, my call on, right? Like I know that I'm trying to hit these milestones during the, the conversation, find the pain, ask the question, book the meeting. I think that in and of itself, like alone just helps an SDR, like settle down a little bit on a cold call and not feel like they yeah. have to be pushing, pushing, pushing for a meeting when they know like, no, I've got a system. The system works. If I believe in this system, I know that over time I'll be able to hit quota. And if I deviate from the system and I try to push people into meetings, or if I, you know, jump down a, a rabbit hole of, uh, like you said, like let the prospect kind of take control. And all of a sudden we're talking for like 15, 20 minutes about something that isn't super relevant. That's yeah. when I start to move away from the ability to hit quota and systematize cold calling. Because at the end of the day, it is another system in your arsenal of outbound motion, of your outbound motion that you use to book meetings. So I think that, um, 
I think just having the system in and of itself is helpful. Yeah, speaking of system, this is sort of a loose segue, but I, I am curious because you touched on it at the very beginning. You don't really do a ton of email or social outreach. Do you have it worked in with your cold calling or is it more something where you're like, oh, this person's not picking up. Let me try emailing. How do you work in the other channels channels with your, your cold calling process? Yeah, so I'm not the best example when it comes to doing that. Um, I might be a little bit of an outlier in that sense, but... Um, the only times I really spent a lot on emailing, and I'm starting to do a little bit more sequencing in, in I use sales off right now, but I've used outreach in the past and I do a, a bit of sequencing now. Um, but most of my sequences in the past have been very automated. Um, so it's not the, the best example when it comes to emailing. Um, but when it does come to emails, something that was driven into my head when I first started was personalized emails. I've um, been making sure that you're spending the time to personalize at least the beginning portion of the email directly to that prospect. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the emails that I'm actually writing in a day and not just throwing it into an automated sequence are personalized emails. Um, those have converted great for me. Um, I don't send a lot. I would definitely say like if I were to book 10 meetings, maybe one is from a personalized email, but I, it's just because I also don't, I don't play that game as much as uh, other SDRs. Um, so I, I do think those are valuable. I do think that some... Most SDRs I know usually around 50-50 where they're booking 50% from cold calls and 50% from emails and LinkedIn is probably part of that email um, percentage. And so I think it's still a great channel to use and, and people should. Um, I just think if you're going to do it and spend time actually writing emails that they really got to be personalized if you want them to really break the mold. Um, or if you aren't going to do that, you should just be automating all of them because there's just no point. Um, doing a half personalized email because someone's going to notice it, or it basically is an automated email at that point. So you might as well just throw them into an automated sequence and not spend, you know, two hours of your day sending personalized emails that don't convert as well as just either picking up the phone or in some cases, automated emails work just great depending on what your ICP is. So, yeah, yeah for sure. There was actually Yesterday, two days ago, AJ and I got this the same email from the same company with just the first sentence changed, and it was exactly the same right underneath. So, to your point, exactly. Yeah, I'm curious. Then you're you talked about how you're like kind of just starting sequencing, kind of incorporating like other touches in. Are when you're reaching out to somebody, I know that there's like the sort of industry standard kind of traditional SaaS sequences, like a combination of. <laughs> Yeah. emails and phone touches over like you know seven to 15 touches over 30 somewhat odd days right like that's when when you ask someone to build a sequence most of the time that's like what they're going to yeah. default to are you just like is your sequence just like 10 emails or like 10 phone calls over like a month or like do you pepper in like one or two emails there like how do you build that out if you're really focused mostly on just cold calling yeah so um i have prospect where I just have in a cold call sequence. So it's literally just cold calls. Um, and then depending on the ICP, typically if I'm leading more higher enterprise companies that are 10,000 employees plus 20,000 employees plus where those people are getting inundated with emails every day anyways. So mm -hmm. it's no point to either do personalize or whatnot. I'll throw them into an automated sequence where in the sense that I have cold call email, that's an automated email right after the cold call is completed. Um, and that's it. And that'll be over the whole month, uh, like you had mentioned. Um, and those convert great, whether that's convert. And typically what you'll see though, is they don't convert usually later down in the sequence. You'll just have those extra. Um, and typically they'll convert on the first, second or third email. After that, if they haven't converted, they're most likely not going to convert on those automated emails, but you'll still have great conversion, um, in those first, uh, few. And I've actually had closed ones off of an automated email, um, like big, bigger accounts that come from those in enterprise. And it, it just works out great because at that point you get to have these book meetings come from emails that you didn't have to spend any time besides the initial writing of. Obviously you should make iterations of those as you go. After that first month of using it, see how well it did, make some adjustments to your first few emails. You shouldn't just leave it and hope that over a year it continues to convert. That's, that's probably not going to work. Um, but uh, over time, making those adjustments can help boost either that reply rate or open rate, uh, whatever that case is for those automated emails. 
Um, so those are the two sequences I really use. But at the end of the day, um, if you really want to, I feel like succeed, you should be at the point where as long as you have a phone number and some out of some way of phoning your prospects, if you can convert just fine with that, you'll be a great SDR at the end of the day. Um, and that's how I feel like, boy, if someone just gave me a phone number and a phone, um, I'd be able to convert and get people on the, the line. I'd probably still need GM info to get a phone number, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Uh, you, you brought up um, testing, iterating, kind of like making sure that, you know, you aren't sending the same message over and over again. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of SDRs don't do that. They like wait for, you know, marketing or for leadership to be like, hey, we're swapping out email templates this month. They're like, your top track, we've evaluated it. We're going to change it up. Here's a new one. Um, I'm curious how you you sort of came to this like perfect cold call orchestration um, how, how much did you like test and iterate the way that you go about that to kind of nail what you're doing now that helps you book so many meetings? Yeah, it took me forever. Um, in the sense that it took, I mean, I say forever, but I would say like, even before I made my first cold call, I probably went through 10 different scripts with the team. I got feedback on it. I practiced cold calling everyone. Um, and from there I had a script that I felt that was worthy at least to make those first initial calls. But then after that, it probably took about six months of me doing that eat the frog from eight to nine in the morning to really narrow down the script and understand. First, I have to understand the product better that I'm even selling, because even you know, if you're two weeks onboarding onto a company is not enough to fully understand what you do and, and, and whatnot. So it's going to take you months. Um, and so after about, I would say between uh, five to six months, that's when I got got the ball rolling between you have your inbound meetings where you're doing more discovery calls you're you're talking more in long form as well about your product or you need if you don't do discovery calls maybe listen to those demos that your aes are doing and really understand how long form it's called talked about so you just better understand what's going on and that's all put together with you know the eat the frog listening to demos doing discovery calls making you know continuously making more cold calls throughout you know you want to be my goal is always $250 a week, no matter what, whether I'm working a four day week, a three day week, five day week, if I'm in the hospital for a day, I'm making $250 a week. Um, it, it's just the case. And that's what's gotten me to be able to do it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it, it took that long. And then at that point you build up where you get to that snowball effect, which is the 15th to the 15th. So at that point, that's when I started to hit that where now I was able to hit quota earlier, which allowed me to you know, get rid of that commission breath and really hone in even more on my cold calls because I was able to get to the better prospects quicker because I would give up easily on the prospects that didn't make sense because mm. they just didn't make sense. So, um, yeah, between five to six months, if you're really, um, you know, working hard, you're really working through your scripts um, and you're making sure to get those dials done and never having a week where you might only do like 10 dollars because you booked a few meetings off email. It's you still got to hit those cold calls. So, um, yeah, it's just a note out there to all of the sales leaders who are like, I could just turn this, you know, new script around. It will be seeing results in no time. Like, no, no. <laughs> and I, that's one of the big fallacies that I see in sales is like, you know, shipping the next best thing. It's always you're, you're ending something too early. You're not getting enough data to prove whether or not it's going to work. And then you, push for the next best thing and you just repeat the cycle over again like you you need a good sample size to figure out like does this system work does this message resonate um and having that feedback loop and like you said kind of building up all of that product and, and sdr acumen early on and figuring out like how to build that foundation is so crucial to being able to drive replicable results because we all know sales is all about ebbs and flows. It's got its ups and downs. Like if you are in a down period and you try something and you think, eh, a month later, this doesn't work, you could be missing out on lar a larger sample size and figuring out that like, oh, this actually does work. The message that we have resonates. We were just reaching out to the wrong people at the wrong time. You just never know. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Alex. You, I, well, I was going to ask, because you, you talked us through this this process that you came up with and everything. Um, have you tried teaching it to other SDRs either on your team or through, you know, other, other avenues? And are there any specific roadblocks that you notice other SDRs run into as they're trying to pick up and, and build up the, the successful sort of strategies that you have there? That was, that was going to be my question. Yeah. That's the same. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, no, it's it's a great question. Like, is this actually applicable outside of just me? Uh, yeah, I, um, yeah. So when I was an SDR lead, obviously that is exactly what I would then coach when it came to cold calling, and I would typically translates well into discovery calls um, as well. If you want to move them to a demo, if that's what your company does in between the cold call and, and demo. Um, and what I saw with the people who I was coaching is obviously the people who go heads down and work on it and really dedicate to really using that, this type of cold call, which it takes a lot because like we already talked about, cold calling can go in every which way. And if you let it go every which way, then you're now not going to that framework. So one that would focus on that framework, um, they would either come closer to quota or they would hit quota after. Um, and whether that was for a few months or, or whatnot, but they, they would typically find themselves in a better situation than they were the, the month previous when moving over to this type of uh, framework um, when I was coaching them. And I, I kind of just preach it to everyone at this point. Um, and I've never gotten someone say, this doesn't work for me. And, and that's, I mean, if that's any feedback, um, that's been, that's been good, but when it's come to actionable, um, who I've seen have used it and put in place, um, and that I've actually coped with and worked with, um, they'll typically find themselves either closer to quota. Um, and that's pretty much just been what I've seen. So it's not just you. Good. Good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you, you also have, speaking of teaching and coaching, you have your own newsletter and podcast. Yep. Um, did you decide to build those because you saw the fact that you were able to like coach other SDRs, um, on your system and see it work and go like, oh, I've got something here. Like I, I've got stuff to share and I want to be able to give back to the world or like, what was the impetus for you to like build that? Um, and what value do you think that it like still brings you today? Yeah. So <laughs> The newsletter is kind of like a, not like a, a gag by any means, but the, the newsletter is built because I felt like a lot of the news that's on LinkedIn is very business and formal and like suited up. And I wanted to make a newsletter that made fun of either business news or just made fun of things in general um, that you'd see on LinkedIn. So it wasn't so much as something for SDRs, but it was for, um, a, because I just, I think morning brew, like people who subscribe to morning brew or longer newsletters, I feel like so at, at some point they decided to make these way longer than two minute reads and now they're five, 10 minute reads. And so I made the one, uh, the uh, one, two, three newsletter, which is a play on if anyone's read the Atomic Habits, the author of Atomic Habits has a three, two, one newsletter. So I just flipped it backwards. Um, and so I just made it a gig, and but also I made it a really quick and easy read. Um, so I was more so on the newsletter and branding. Like I really love LinkedIn, and I think it's a great spot right now, especially in business. So I, I built that out um, just to have something to do also on like Tuesday morning to write it up and keep myself also educated on what's going on. Um, but on the SDR Handbook podcast side of things, that's definitely where I saw this gap of, and sort of something that you guys are, are doing as well, which is um, the case that, a lot of the content that was out there that I saw was more so geared towards like account executives or lower level um, sales funnel activities. And that's just not applicable to SDRs. Like we have never talked in this conversation about how to go through a whole follow up with a sales after a demo and whatnot, because that's just not applicable um, to a SDR when they're in the role. Um, and so I wanted to speak with SDRs, speak with SDR managers, speak with VPs of sales, but just specifically about prospecting, top of funnel activities, um, and and whatnot, and also have this SDR handbook because we don't just sit down with SDRs or senior SDRs and, and whatnot. We have specific episodes where we're doing deep dives into each thing, like emailing, personalized emailing, cold calling, where at one point I, I do want to do like one hour, two hour episodes where you can sit down and learn as much as you possibly can and completely for free um, as well. And just have a spot for an SDR to look at and say, this is like, where I can build my personal handbook because by no means do I think that we have all the answers or that you could come to the SDR handbook podcast to understand everything about being an SDR, but at least it'll lay like the groundwork for you to build your own system that, that works at the end of the day. Um, and so that was the, the inspiration for the SDR handbook podcast and why uh, I enjoy posting that every Thursday. I think we've missed one week since we first started, but, uh, they've been really enjoyable uh, to put those out and, 
um, see the reactions from the SDR um, community when it comes to it. Awesome. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, there's definitely, I think, this like influx of content specifically geared towards SDRs that's that's coming, mm -hmm. I guess, getting better, yeah. you would call it. Um, there's, yeah. It's like the best time and worst time in, in the world to be an SDR, <laughs> yeah. where like you've got all of these different resources and tools and assets for you to like get really good at being an SDR. But like you said, you get a one in 100 pickup rate on the phone and like email reply rates are plummeting so there's this like dichotomy of yeah it's super easy to like get started and learn but also the world is inundated with cold messages and you have to work really really hard to stand out yeah. so you get a little bit of both but i think this is it's an exciting time i'll say that to be an sdr with all of the different resources available to you and and the opportunity really to um give yourself a, a leg up on the rest of your peers and really stand out and try to build a career around your sort of SDR prospecting and, and what that can that can mean for you and um, what the future holds for you. So it's a pretty cool time. Way different than 2013 when I started. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Picking up that Polycom phone. Um, awesome. Well, Taylor, thanks for, for being here. Really appreciate you sharing some insight and laying out that framework for the perfect cold call. If, um, if people want to get in touch with you, learn more about what you're doing with uh, Quack specifically in your, your podcast and all the stuff that you talked about, how can they do that? Yeah, so everything's through my LinkedIn. You can find all these resources uh, through there. But um, the SDR Handbook podcast is specifically on Spotify, so you can listen to that there. Um, when it comes to Quack, you can go to Um If you use Outreach or Sales Loft right now and want to be able to make uh, more dials quicker, um, just reach out and you can book a demo through the website and, and check us out there. Um, so that's quackdials.com. Um, but if you just want to have general information or just general chat about SDRs, uh, I'd love to just connect with me on LinkedIn and shoot me a message and always happy to just chat and uh, do that. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, listeners, remember to subscribe to unsubscribe, get more tips, tricks, and insights like this in your inbox, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Taylor. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks. Thanks for watching this episode of Unsubscribe, the Demand Drive podcast. If you want less of those nasty unsubscribe emails in your inbox, go ahead and check out some of the content we have to the left. And make sure that you subscribe to Unsubscribe to keep your SDR team in tip-top shape.